Welcome to Taiwan Talks. I'm Rath Wang. Former U.S. President Donald Trump's comments on Taiwan has once again made headlines. This time, he's doubled down on demanding that Taiwan increase its defense spending. We'll talk about what that could mean for the country and how Ukraine, another democracy under threat by its giant authoritarian neighbor, also plays into the equation. Joining us to discuss this today are Ji Ho Chang, Keelong City Councilor from the ruling DPP, Stephen Wang, Foreign Policy Advisor at the Office of ROC Legislator, Xu Chaoxing. A very warm welcome to both on the show today. In a recent interview with the Washington Post, the Republican presidential candidate demanded that Taiwan increase its defense spending to 10% of its GDP. That is equivalent to 81.7 billion US dollars annually. Jiho, as a member of the ruling party, what do you say to that? I think he's, he's just trying to, this is kind of a sort of um, uh, a, a deal tactic, right? I, I don't think 10% increase is a reasonable increase for any country by any means. Uh, if you look at the, uh, the, the this military spending of all the countries in the world, very few have even succeed at more than like four to five percent of the GDPs. So if you ask Taiwan to, to, to do that, of course, uh, in absolute numbers, I, I think Mr. Trump is saying that uh, Taiwan should be a more responsible uh, geopolitical actor in the region. And that I think we, are not, we can all agree with that. But uh, uh, realistically speaking, it's, it's, it's not as feasible for any country to just increase their military spending from 2.45% uh, to 10% within a year. So within a span of, of some time, we, we will have an, a steady rise. And uh, that has been the, 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 uh, what has been happening for the last eight years. So we have e increased from 2% all the way to 2.45%. And we are uh, going to invest more in our military, in the, in the welfare of our military personnel. And that is not going to change. And that is, we'll, we will invest more, that's for sure. But 10%, that, that just doesn't add up. So I think we, we, what, what, uh, what's more reasonable, reasonable is that if uh, Mr. Trump gets to get reelected again, uh, we will have to negotiate uh, some, part of, uh, some sort of a middle ground where we can all agree uh, as uh, uh, democratic alliances and uh, our uh, partners in the region that we can all agree on the, uh, the amount of investment we put into our military and, and defense budget. So in your conversations with the administration and also people within the DPP, how are they taking this? Um, and what would you say would be reasonable if 10% is not? Well. If you look at the, uh, the, the last eight years, you can see that there's a steady rise. Of course, I think uh, uh, as the, uh, the, the, the military escalation uh, uh, gets uh, more severe, of course, there's more the demand for the, uh, the, the military to enhance even faster. So I think we, we can see a, a bigger ratio but I, I can't tell you, you know, the exact numbers of, of, the, of the adding up. But we can, we can foresee that it, it will be increased. Uh, I think our only problem is not really the willingness of the administration to add that. Uh, I think it's, it's more about how we can have a, a consensus within our country, especially within the parliament, within the, uh, the legislature, that we can all work on, we can all come to a common ground on, on how much uh, increase we can have. Taiwan's current defense budget for next year is 2.45% of the country's GDP. An increase to 10% GDP would equal to 84% of the central government's entire 2025 annual budget. Stephen, practically speaking, should Donald Trump be reelected president, do you think he would push for this and is this attainable? I mean, first of all, whether or not President Trump, well, former President Trump will be elected as the new president is up to the American people to decide. And I think number two, let's assume in that kind of scenario, is tr if a uh, 
future Trump administration is really asking about 10% uh, of GDP to be devoted into defense budget. I mean, first of all, we probably need to have some constitutional amendments in the Taiwan's part because Article 164 of our constitution actually stated that at least 15% of our total national budget has to be on science, education, and also cultural services. Um, so if 10% equals to 84% of our central government spending, assuming we don't change anything or not changing too much, then, you know, first step is already a very monumental task for everybody here in Taiwan. You know, as, as, as some people might know, and, and for those who didn't know, it is the threshold for any constitutional amendments in Taiwan is extremely high. So uh, when, it, when it comes to that um, spending, you know, I would say, assuming that scenario really happens, right? Um, one of the things that we think well, I personally, and perhaps some members of the KMT also thinks that you know, there should be uh, some very clear ideas conveyed to Washington in terms of, okay, if we do the 10%, it, it has to be a, some sort of, there should be some reciprocity, right? So if we uh, essentially realize somehow that target or close to that target, what does that say for the American policy on Taiwan? You know, does that mean Americans are gonna devote it into more, uh, you can say, legal or any, any other source of obligation towards Taiwan? Would you see more in terms of the defense aspect or more in terms of technology as we see TSMC opening fabs in Arizona? What do you think specifically would be those um, benefits that Taiwan could re-up from the U.S.? if in turn it does increase its defense budget? I mean, I think the first thing is, for example, if we increase our defense budget and we appropriate more of that budget into buying US uh, military weapons, for example, does that mean we will have bigger bargaining power? Does that mean we will get the equipments that perhaps the current administration or the future administration uh, somehow is a little bit unwilling to uh, provide us to Taiwan previously? So those are some of the things that I believe um, if somehow uh, Taiwan can sufficiently increase the budget towards any, anywhere close to 10% of the GDP, and again, it's extremely hard, then uh, I do believe you know, Taiwan should have more say when it comes to uh, whether or not the Americans can actually help Taiwan to realize some of the priorities that we have in our defense policies. If you were in the administration, what do you feel would be the top priority in terms of defense now? So um, if referring back to, for example, the KMT's platform in 2024, we're talking about, uh, again, you know, precisely like the city council says, increasing the welfare and the benefits of our uh, soldiers, individual soldiers. And perhaps also number two is, we also maybe need to do a little bit of a review when it comes to what kind of capability that Taiwan can get uh, and can actually form into the existing battle order to be put into instant use, um, maybe perhaps for the next three to four years, you know, as we all know about the uh, 2027 Davison window, right? So I think if we have those increased budgets, uh, there, there needs to be a uh, thorough discussion when it comes to what are some of the achievable short-term or immediate-term spendings that we can actually do to increase not only the, battle, the, the, the qualities of our soldiers' individual equipments and also to boost our citizens' confidence on the defense of our own country. Jiho, I wanted to turn to tariffs, and Trump has mentioned tariffs and putting 100% tariffs on China if he is reelected, and also other countries that um, could affect how the dollar is the global currency now. And this has been specifically also electric vehicles from China, such as the BYD. How do you think that would affect the U.S. and also Taiwan, given that when we've seen during the first trade war, um, Taiwanese companies actually benefited. We saw um, a number of companies move from China to Taiwan, including foreign and Taiwanese companies. But we are talking about this on the premise that this 100% tariff is really going to be implemented on all goods from China, right? Uh, I, uh, this is during the election time, and this is like the one of the, the last uh, weeks before the campaign ended. So I, I wouldn't say that this kind of talk uh, should be taken like, uh, at, at uh, a literal value. So uh, 
But if it were true and if it, if it were to happen, I would say uh, it's really uncertain for us to, to determine what might happen next, because some would say it's, it's, not, it's, not going to be, it's not going to end well on both ends of the Pacific, right? But, um, 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 Economists have said that yeah, it would be a lose-lose situation yeah, yeah, yeah. for both. So, so I th I, and I would, I would tend to agree that if that were true, because if you, if you um, uh, divide them into different categories and different, uh, in terms of security reasons, in terms of technological reasons, there might be a severity of the, uh, the tariffs. But if it were to be implemented on everything, that, that, that might hit hard on the consumer market, especially for the average Americans. When Mr. Trump, former President Trump, said those things, we have to look at them in the context of the current campaign that they're running. The, the, the swing states, the, 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 the states that, that do have an employment problem, that do have, like the Rust Belt, they, they do have this uh, long-running industrial and, and economy problems. Those places tend to uh, respond more favorably to, um, to this kind of talk. But, but um, of course, uh, when, when we go back to the, the first term of uh, Mr. Trump's presidency, uh, we, I don't think we really got the full scope of his uh, trade war with China because the outbreak of the, uh, the, the COVID sort of messed things up. So it became a, 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 too much of a variable to, for us to really understand the scope of that trade war or, or the, the aftermath of it. So, so um, if we come back to, the, to, the, to this uh, specific 100% uh, uh, tariff thing, I, I, I think we still have to see uh, if it were really going to happen. So for Taiwan, you feel it's still an unknown in terms of what will happen if there is another severe trade war? Yeah, but, but it, of course I think we have, uh, we have pretty much uh, uh, cleaned the floor with that one because uh, uh, f the, the last time it hit, the, uh, the Taiwanese business who invested in China or, or, or you know, uh, manufactured in China pretty much have uh, uh, moved their uh, ventures elsewhere. So um, uh, for those who decided to stay in China, uh, I, I think they're pretty much um, more uh, embedded within the Chinese economy already. So that, that means that they are probably going to hit less on the Taiwan economy as a whole. Going back to the campaign, um, you both spent quite t some time in North America. And Stephen, how do you see the China card being played out here in the US? And, its context with Taiwan. Do you feel that this is an effective campaign strategy as we see Harris also talk about China and going strong on dictators? Yeah, so I, first of all, I think throughout the past two and a half years, you know, I've been DC for a while, um, this, this idea of a very severe and intense strategic competitive competition with uh, the PRC has become a dominant subject within the uni United States, right? You have the DOD, for example, defined not only China as a near peer competitor, but also at the same time, a revisionist power. So um, it is inevitable uh, for a lot of people who in Washington are fixated on a competition with China, both economically and perhaps also on the security perspective, to view Taiwan in that same context. So uh, I do think you know Taiwan is, I wouldn't use the word as a convenient car, but I think it is a, 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 a sort of, you know, a, a point that is easy for both candidates to get. You know, Taiwan is a vibrant democracy. So when you go onto the campaign trail and says, you know, we're gonna defend a democracy against a autocracy, you know, people generally clap their hands. So, uh, but I still do have to say that a lot of the uh, discussions, uh, perhaps within Washington, D.C., are still revolving around, how do you think about, uh, they, they think about Taiwan in the context of, great power competition. So that is something that I think 
And number one, Taiwan ourselves. Uh, number one, perhaps we had to get used to that. But also number two, of course, we're going to emphasize you know, the uniqueness of Taiwan and perhaps uh, encourage people in Washington to think outside of that context on Taiwan. But there also seems to be um, an inward looking narrative on both sides, one on the Republican where side where um, there's a focus more on mm. um, or insular outlook on defense and on being more um, America first, where the de Democrats seem to be more on peace and not going to war. So how does Taiwan fit into that equation, given that there's an imminent threat right next door? So I think uh, the first thing that Taiwan has to do, I think, is to convey clearly uh, to the people of the United States that Taiwan remains a core national interest for the United States. Uh, I think it is without a doubt within a lot of uh, decision makers' point of view that Taiwan is indeed a critical part of our U.S. Um, national interest. For example, Taiwan is at the center part of the so-called first island chain and that U.S. commitment or any source of U.S. support to Taiwan will affect how their treaty allies, for example, like South Korea and also Japan, view the United States. So I think that's, that's the first point. We, we in Taiwan needs to clearly convey this idea that we are your core national interests and we uh, are aligned with your social value. Uh, we are both democracies and all these. And also number two is to keep our core industry in Taiwan. Uh, for example, TSMC is one of the greatest assets uh, for Taiwan currently. And you know, that is one of the things that makes Taiwan in this global supply chain right now to be an indispensable character. If we lose those kind of things, we are also decreasing uh, our significance potentially. So though, I think those are some of the things that we need to uh, work a little bit harder uh, to convey uh, to Washington. Speaking about shared national interests and protecting democracy, let's now talk about another democracy, Ukraine, and its impact on this close election. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky met separately with both U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris and President Joe Biden. He then also met with former President Donald Trump at the Trump Tower in New York. Zelensky reiterated his victory plan against the Russian invasion. President Biden also announced an additional eight billion U.S. dollars in military aid to Ukraine. Meanwhile, in Harris's joint press conference with Zelensky, she directly called out Donald Trump's plans on ending the war. There's something she calls both dangerous and unacceptable. Jiho, what does this show seeing Zelensky courting both the Republicans and the Democrats? I can really empathize with whatever uh, is happening uh, between uh, President Zelensky and the, the candidates of the US presidential elections. Because either way, one has to be the president within a month. And we, either Taiwan or Ukraine, we would always need to be, still be the partner that we always need to be. So, uh, so, so it, for, the, for President Zelensky, it doesn't matter whatever they were saying during the campaign. But what matters is the, 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 the real policy remains the same. The, the, the military aid and the, the various other uh, packages were still coming in because uh, this is really a, a, a fight for value, right? It's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not so uh, solely on the geopolitical concerns uh, or, or other means. So, um, so from Taiwan's point of view, we can, we can see where he's coming from and we wish him the best. But is Taiwan in a better position, given that some Republicans, even those close to Donald Trump, are saying that support for Ukraine should be limited and the focus should be in the Pacific here with China and Taiwan as a core part of that? Yeah, of course. Um, uh, just like uh, Stephen had said uh, very, very eloquently, uh, that uh, Taiwan has our assets like the TMC and and other technological uh, uh, advances. Stephen, with Donald Trump, do you feel there is reason for concern, even though Taiwan may be in a better position than Ukraine, given that Donald Trump has talked about 
perhaps it's what Jiho mentioned being on the campaign trail, but his close relationships with Vladimir Putin and with Xi Jinping, does that concern democratic countries that align with the U.S.? I think to a certain extent, um, you do have uh, people not only just in Washington, but also capitals in Asia um, concerned about the uh, a potential future Trump administration's more transactional diplomacy. Right? So uh, I think Japan experienced that before, uh, South Korea experienced that before. And to a certain extent, uh, I think Taiwan is, is also potentially facing that kind of problem as well. You know, Trump. Uh, in his former interviews, previous interviews, did talk about the potentiality of taxing TSMC because it's, you know, stealing jobs away from the United States. So, so you're saying Taiwan was lucky in the past Trump administration that Taiwan wasn't the prime target. I would say Taiwan is quite lucky because, you know, f uh, first of all, Trump's latter two years of the uh, first Trump administration was entirely focused on competition with China, particularly the trade war. And you know, for the Japanese and for the South Koreans, there were this very tricky issue about how do you share the burdens of U.S. forces on both South Korea and Japan, and also how, you know, uh, South Korea and Japan was very looking forward to a what a CPTPP might look like with the uh, return of the United States, for example. So I think Taiwan did, to a certain extent, dodge that bullet and uh, was put into high emphasis by the Trump administration for the past two years. Will we see that sort of treatment uh, to Taiwan in a potential future Trump administration? It is, uh, we're still gonna watch and see. According to a Pew Research Center polling, we've seen 31% of Americans believe that the U.S. is providing too much support to Ukraine. That number is even higher for Republicans where over 49%, close to half, believe that the U.S. is providing too much support. Um, this is a question for both of you. Um, mm -hmm. Do you feel that Taiwan should be concerned given this insular look? With these numbers, not of campaigns, but of Americans, do you feel that could impede any U.S. support for Taiwan in the case of a Chinese invasion? U.S. history, uh, it has been a foreign so-called projection of U.S. military power uh, usually comes at a high political cost for American leaders. And a lot of times it's really up to the con conviction of, for example, U.S. presidents if he or she uh, decides to intervene. Uh, because, you know, number one, there's no clear legal obligation for the United States to do that besides, besides you have the TRA, for example. So I think ultimately it is up to the highest office of the United States to make that final and probably one of the most consequential call. Uh, in terms of intervening into a Taiwan Strait that has open military conflict. Jiho, what do you think in terms of um, both parties, if Harris becomes president or if Trump becomes president, do you feel that Taiwan policy could significantly shift given the growing threat we see from China? We'll see a, a, a consistent U.S. policy towards Taiwan, no matter who wins the presidency. Uh, I, I, I didn't think so before, but uh, after the past 10 years of a Trump administration and a Biden administration, now I truly believe that there is this consistent U.S. Taiwan policy that, that is going to persist because the Taiwan policy for the U.S. is really beyond the partisan divisions. Now, what the former President Trump has said, I think he, he has a good point in that Taiwan does have to uh, live up to its, its uh, role in, in the region, that we have to contribute and invest more into our military, into our defense. Stephen, what do you think? Joe Biden will be out of office, and even though if Kamala Harris becomes president, it will be a different team. And if it's Donald Trump, the former president will bring in his own team and Republicans will be back. Is there anything you think Taiwan needs to deal with that or even including with the PRC, perhaps seeing this in, as an opportunity when there's a change of guard in Washington? I mean, certainly, of course, I think the, the Taiwanese people and also our government officials and diplomats in Washington, D.C. are very familiar with 
the uh, uh, the core team of President uh, Biden's uh, people, you know, uh, talking about Secretary of State and also the basic positions of the Department of State and also the DOD. So uh, whoever comes into power, we're going to make new friends and we're going to make them our best friends. So you're not worried. So um, one of the things that I, I am a little bit concerned is it really, again, right, it really depends on who uh, is going to be put back into the uh, key positions within the U.S. government related to Taiwan, right? So. In terms of Harris, I do not have a lot of comments on that, to be honest, because uh, we, we probably will, will guess that the broad direction will continue uh, when it comes to the existing administration's policy. But for example, if you have uh, people from the GOP who uh, at this moment and previously have been advocating for the increase of defense budget from 5%, 5% to 10%, if those people go into the administration and want to translate that into some sort of USA diplomatic moves or maneuvers on Taiwan, you know, that is one of the challenges I think this administration in Taiwan has to confront. Thank you very much for both of your insights. If you liked our show, please search for us on YouTube, give us a thumbs up, and hit subscribe to our channel. Thank you for watching our show. Stay safe and see you next time. In the face of adversity, the power of truth. A roadmap for a just and open world, charted by the freest country in Asia. Taiwan Plus News, a voice of freedom in Asia.